We will now continue our discussion on motion of objects by looking at falling objects. Now, what make things fall? When I drop an object, you know it falls. What makes things fall? Objects fall under the action of a net force. And that net force is the force of gravity. Now watch an object falling. I want you to watch carefully. Now each second the distance it travels get greater and greater and greater. That means a falling object is accelerating. A falling object has an acceleration. Now what is the force that produces that acceleration on a falling object? It is the force of gravity. So the net force acting on a falling object is the force of gravity. And that net force produces an acceleration on a falling object. And we are going to call this acceleration the acceleration due to gravity. So every object when dropped Every object falls with an acceleration. We call it acceleration due to gravity. And we will represent that by G. So whenever we want to represent the acceleration of a freely falling object, we will use the small g for that. What is it called? It is it's called acceleration due to gravity. Now, the net force due to gravity on an object of mass M. That means, if I have an object of mass M, and the force of gravity is going to produce on it an acceleration G, what is that force of gravity? You know that F net equal to MA. And in this case, the acceleration A is g so every time you want to talk about the acceleration of a falling object in place of a you will be using g g is the acceleration of a falling object therefore we can say the net force that makes an object fall equal to m times g where g is the acceleration of free fall now this net force is called the weight of the object. You see, the term weight is very often misunderstood, even by science students. Weight is not the same as mass. You see, a weight is not measured in kilogram. What is a weight? A weight is a force. <clears throat> now, the net force that makes an object fall is called its weight. In other words, F net equal to mg, this net force on an object is called the weight of the object. So look at this again. Mass and weight are two different things. Mass is measured in kilogram, whereas weight is a force and it is given by mass multiplied by g and what is the unit for measuring weight weight is a force therefore weight will be measured using the units of force and what is the unit of force it is a newton so weight of an object is a force and it is measured in newton don't you ever measure your weight in pounds or kilogram. It is to be measured in Newton because it is a force. Now, notice that the weight of an object is not the same as its mass. Mass is measured in kilogram, whereas weight is measured in Newton. Now, this value of G has 
See, G is the acceleration due to gravity. Any object that falls freely falls with an acceleration G. And it has a value. The value of G is the value of G is 9.8 meter per second squared. That means any falling object will fall with this acceleration. And now, if G equal to 9.8 meter per second squared, for convenience, I'm going to use 10. See, very easy to use 10 in that, that case. Now, therefore, if weight is equal to mg, your mass measured in kilogram multiplied by this value of g, that will give you your weight in Newton. All right, let's go and discuss more on that. Now, if you look at objects falling, all objects fall. When objects fall, the net force on any object that is falling is the weight. This ball falls because it has a net force on it, that is the weight. The airplane, if the engine finishes off, the net force on it will be its weight, it will fall. So, the acceleration of all falling objects is G, the acceleration due to gravity, and the net force is the weight of the object, and the weight equal to mass times G. What did I say the value of G is? 9.8 meter per second squared. Now that means all falling objects have the same acceleration. Now let me ask you this. Suppose your mass, suppose you measure your mass as, uh, let me, suppose your mass is 80 kilogram. What is your weight? Can you tell me what your weight will be? If your mass is 80 kilogram, what is your weight? Your weight is the net force acting on you. And weight equal to mg, mass times g. And that means it will be 80 kilogram multiplied by, in place of 9.8, I'm going to use 10. It's much easier. 10 meter per second squared. So, Mass is 80 kilogram. G, the acceleration due to gravity, is 10 meter per second squared. Therefore, your weight will be 80 kilogram multiplied by 10 meter per second squared, and that is equal to 800 newton. You see, the weight of an 80 kilogram person is 800 Newton. It is not my weight. My weight is very small. It's only about 600 Newton. Right? Okay. Let's now continue. Does it mean that all objects drop at the same rate? Does it mean that if I drop two objects, in other words, if I drop these two objects, Will they both fall at the same rate? What I said so far is that every falling object has the same acceleration. Now, if all falling objects have the same acceleration, does it mean that all dropping objects, if I drop these two objects from the same height, will they fall to the ground at the same time? What do you think? Well, Look at uh, this illustration. I'm dropping an elephant and a little feather. And assuming that this space is vacuum, there is no air there, the acceleration of the elephant and the little feather will be the same. They both fall at the same time. Why? Because they both have the same acceleration. 
So in the absence of air resistance, the elephant and the feather will fall to the ground at the same time. You want to try it out, now go to an elevated place, take a small stone and a big stone, try to drop them from the same height and see if they both fall to the ground at the same time. If you are not satisfied, let me know, we will talk about it. This means that, irrespective of mass, every object falls at the same rate. Every object that falls has the same acceleration. What do you call that acceleration? Acceleration due to gravity, we represent that by g. And what is the value of that g? It is 9.8 meter per second squared. Actually, in practice, when you do this experiment, that's why I told you, call me back after doing the experiment. In practice, things may not be falling at the same time because air resistance will affect objects in different ways. So, if you drop an elephant and a feather, they may not fall. Look at this. Watch this again. The elephant will fall much faster than the feather in, in, in practice. Why? Because the feather is subjected to the air resistance, it falls very slow. But if you do the experiment in vacuum, where there's no air, both will fall at the same rate. That is what the law says. All right. Now, why does an object which encounters air resistance eventually reach a terminal speed? That means every object that is dropped is actually subjected to an air resistance. So, when I drop it, the weight of the object is pulling it down, giving it an acceleration. And the air resistance is applied upward. Now, what happens is, as the velocity, as the speed of motion increases, the resistance also increases. A time will come when the downward force, the weight of the object, is balanced by the upward resistance. And when that happens, there will be no net force on the object. And you know, according to Newton's law, if there is no net force, an object in motion will continue to move without a change. So the object has acquired a certain velocity by the time it, the two forces are balanced. From then on, the object will move with a constant velocity and that velocity is called the terminal velocity. If you drop an object from a great height, as it keeps falling, its velocity will keep on increasing. And as the velocity increases, the air resistance also will increase. A time will come when the weight of the object acting downward will be balanced by the air resistance. And from that time, the object will continue to fall with a uniform velocity. And that velocity is what we call the terminal velocity. And very often skydivers use that. You spread your arms so that as you fall, the air resistance increases. Uh, at a certain time, there will be no net force on you. You can see here, as you keep falling, as your speed increases, the air resistance increases. And at this time, your weight and the air resistance balance each other. There is no net force on you and you will fall from this time with a terminal velocity. So I hope you have a fair understanding now of what terminal velocity is. Let's now talk about projectile motion. What is a projectile? A projectile, once projected, continues in motion by its own inertia and is influenced only by the downward force of gravity. Now, any object, you see, if I drop something, 
it's actually a projectile. Also, if I watch this now, I'm going to throw this pencil like this. That's a projectile. Now, once you release it, the only force on that is the force of gravity. That means it will keep falling downward due to the force of gravity. So, once you project a projectile, the only force on the projectile is the force of gravity. Now, remember, a force is required only to change the state of motion. Once the motion is established, in the absence of a force, the object will continue in that state of motion. Now, you must understand that law is a terrific statement. It has a great big meaning. So, once you project something, it give, once you give something a motion, the object will continue in that state of motion unless there is an unbalanced force acting on it. Now, a vertical projectile is an object that is thrown vertically up or simply a, a ball dropped from a height. For example, this is a vertical projectile. This is a vertical projectile, a ball that is thrown up and comes back. And this is a vertical projectile. All these are examples of vertical projectiles. Now, it's initial upward velocity. So, if you give an initial upward velocity, it carries the object to a certain height where the velocity is going to be zero. And then on, it will fall back. But remember, the moment the ball is released from your hand, the force of gravity is acting on it. And that's the reason why the velocity gradually decreases. Why does the velocity decrease? Because there is a net force on it. What is the net force? The force of gravity. The force of gravity will change the velocity. Velocity decreases to zero and then increases in the opposite direction. All right. Let's now talk about a horizontal projectile. What is a horizontal projectile? Now, if I keep this block of wood on this book and give this a quick, brisk, say, kick to that way, horizontally. Shall I do it? There'll be a big sound. All right, I'm going to project it horizontally. Watch here. There you are. That is a horizontal projectile. Okay. Horizontal projectiles are objects thrown horizontally from a height. Now here you can see an example of a horizontal projectile. A cannon is fired horizontally. Now if you notice, that cannonball has two distinct types of motion. What are they? It moves horizontally as well as it moves vertically. I want you to look at the arrows marked on it. Look at this arrow, the horizontal arrow. It is not changing. The horizontal motion will not change. Why? Because there is no horizontal force on that ball. Whereas the vertical motion, the speed vertically is increasing. What's the arrow? It's growing. You see? So, the ball has a horizontal motion and a vertical motion. The horizontal motion is not affected. Why is it not affected? Because there is no horizontal force. Is there anything pulling or pushing that cannonball horizontally? No. Therefore, its horizontal motion remains a constant. Watch here. This is its horizontal velocity. 100 meter per second. It does not change. The moment it is projected, that remains a constant. But the vertical velocity, look at this, it keeps on increasing 10, 20, 30, 40, 100, 120. Because the net force vertically increases its speed. 
A horizontal projectile has two types of motion. Since it is thrown with a horizontal velocity, it has a horizontal motion which does not change. Because it is thrown from a height, as soon as it is released, it begins to fall freely. That means the motion of the ball projected horizontally and the motion if it is simply dropped, the vertical motions are exactly the same. There is no difference because both are moving under the same net force, the force of gravity. The combination of vertical and horizontal travel gives the object this curved path. See, the path followed by the projectile is due to its horizontal motion and its vertical motion. And now, once again, the horizontal motion is not affected. The horizontal motion remains a constant. Where the vertical motion, the speed keeps on increasing downward because of the force of gravity. So, while the velocity in the horizontal direction remains the same, the velocity in the downward direction increases as though the horizontal motion does not exist. A very important uh, situation. Now, the vertical and horizontal motions of a projectile are independent of each other. What does that mean? They are independent of each other. The vertical motion will not affect the horizontal motion. And the horizontal motion will not affect the vertical motion. Now, watch here. I have uh, shown the motion of that uh, cannonball horizontally and vertically. Now, in, at the end of the first second, the ball is over here. That means it has traveled horizontally that much and vertically a very small distance. But at the end of the second second, I want you to watch this one here. This is where you start. And this is where the ball is at the end of the first second, second second, third second, fourth second, fifth second. Look at the horizontal and vertical motion. At the end of the first second, it traveled 25 meters horizontally and traveled a very small distance vertically. At the end of the second second, its horizontal distance now is 50 meter. You see that? The horizontal motion is uniform, 25 plus 25, 50. Whereas the vertical distance has increased considerably. And if you notice, every second, the horizontal motion increases by 25 meter. So 25, 50, 75, 100, 125. The horizontal motion is uniform, whereas the vertical motion you got, you keep on accelerating. In the first second, it traveled that much. In the second second, look at the drop, a lot of drop. In the third second, a lot more. In the fourth second, a lot more. There is an acceleration downward. What is this acceleration? That is the acceleration due to gravity. So what it tells you is that the vertical motion of this ball is the same as though the ball was simply dropped. You see, the vertical motion does not know that there is a horizontal motion. That's the meaning Vertical and horizontal motions are independent of each other. Now watch the animation here. I'm projecting a ball and watch its horizontal and vertical motions. There you are. You see, I projected one horizontally, I dropped one, and, and you can see the independence of horizontal and vertical motions. The vertical motion of the blue ball and the vertical motion of the red ball are exactly the same. That means if you project the ball horizontally 
And if you simply drop the ball, they both will fall at the same time. Now, I can actually show you an animation here. Let me see if I can show that to you. Well, the animation did not come up, but uh, it is uh, an animation where this ball is dropped from there, and this ball is projected horizontally, and that's a beautiful animation, and you can actually see both falling on the ground at the same time. All right, but it didn't work. Let's now talk about projectiles at an angle. So far, we were talking about projectiles that are projected horizontally. How about a projectile projected at an angle? An object projected at an angle, again, travels horizontally as well as vertically. That is the characteristic of a projectile. Now, look at the motion of a golf ball. When the golf, the person hits the golf ball, it travels along this arch. It has a horizontal motion and a vertical motion. The golf ball travels a vertical distance and a horizontal distance. The horizontal distance traveled by a projectile is called its range. Well, when Tiger Woods hits a par 5, he is looking for the maximum range, maximum horizontal distance. Is that right? Yes. The range depends on the angle of projection. Is that right? Well, there is a particular angle that will give you a maximum value of the range. Now watch how the velocity changes vertically and remains the same horizontally. Now here I have a the animation of a projectile. I want you to watch its vertical and horizontal motions. Now, let's first watch the horizontal motion. Look at the arrow there. What can you say about the horizontal motion? It remains the same. That means the velocity, the moment you project it, its horizontal velocity does not change anymore. Why? The same reason we talked about in the last one. Because there is no horizontal force. So, the moment you project a ball, its horizontal velocity, once again, does not change. Alright? Now, the velocity is written here. 60 meters per second is the horizontal velocity. It does not change. But look at the vertical velocity. The vertical velocity decreases, reaches zero there, and then increases in the opposite direction. You see? The vertical motion, the velocity decreases, reaches zero, and then increases in the opposite direction. And that is a projectile. I hope you understand why this is so. Now, what is the best angle of projection? for maximum range. I want you to watch this animation. I have uh, given an animation for angle of projection 30 degrees, 45 degrees and 60 degrees. Which of these give you the maximum range? Well, what do you think? Maximum range is for 45 degrees. That means if you want the golf ball to go a maximum distance horizontally, you must hit the ball at 45 degrees. Now, an interesting projectile dilemma. All right, I want you to watch this and see whether you can answer some of the questions. A monkey is hanging from the branch of a tree. There's the monkey hanging from a tree in a zoo. And you know the zookeeper, he's a joker. He wants to feed the monkey by shooting bananas at him. So here it is, he has got his cannon and he's going to shoot the bananas at the monkey. But there's a little problem. You see, the monkey is very anxious to get the banana. The moment the zookeeper shoots the banana, 
the monkey is going to let go of the branch. That means the monkey thinks he will get the banana only if he jumps. Now, what do you think about this? Now, the question is, the zookeeper has to now make a decision. Where should he aim the banana? Now, if the zookeeper aims above the monkey, what would be the path of the banana? Would the banana hit the monkey? If you were the zookeeper, which direction will you aim the banana so that the monkey will still get it? Because the moment the banana comes out of the gun, the monkey is going to drop from the branch. So what is the angle at which the zookeeper should project the banana? Now look at this one. The banana was projected above. So the monkey didn't get it. The zookeeper aimed the banana. Look at this. This is the direction of aiming the banana. That means it was aimed directly above the monkey. And the monkey didn't get it. Tell me, therefore, what should be the direction at which the zookeeper must aim it? If the zookeeper aims directly at the monkey, should the zookeeper aim the banana directly at the monkey? Directly like this. Will the monkey get it? All right, watch this. Yes. The zookeeper aimed the gun directly at the monkey and the monkey got it. Why? Can you give me an explanation? You see, the moment the banana comes out of the gun, the banana and the monkey are falling at the same rate. The banana is falling, the monkey also is falling. Because the rate of flow is the same, if you aim the banana exactly at the monkey, the banana and the monkey will always be falling together and the monkey will get the banana. You see how simple it is. Now, what will happen if the banana is projected at a low speed? What do you think? The, the projection velocity is smaller. Well, look what happens. As long as you aim the banana at the monkey, even if the speed is low, the monkey will get it. So, if the monkey is going to be dropping the moment the banana is fired, you've got to fire the banana at the monkey. You see, only then will the monkey get it. Why? Because the banana, the moment it is fired, falls at the same rate as the monkey. So the banana falls, the monkey falls, and the monkey will get the banana. You can see, the banana is continuously falling. You see that? And the monkey also is falling. And the monkey gets the banana. Okay, I want you to watch another animation and give me an explanation of that. A ball is fired upward from the back of a truck. That is moving forward with the uniform velocity Vx. Where will the ball land? What's this? All right. I want you to look at this and write a paragraph on why it behaves like this. What is the reason why the ball projected from the truck comes back and falls at the same point. Why does it behave like this? Now write a paragraph on this and email it to me. All right? Okay. Now see, look how interesting these phenomena are. And they are all things that we see in our everyday life. It's all over us. We live in a world of projectiles. Have you ever thought of that? Okay, let's move on. Let's now talk about Newton's third law of motion. We discussed two laws of motion early. We will now talk about Newton's third law of motion. It says, for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. In other words, it tells me, if my right hand hit my left hand, my left hand will hit back. 
Well, is that so? For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. The statement means that every interaction, in every interaction, there is a pair of forces. Whenever forces interact, they always come in pairs. When I hit my left hand, my, my right hand applies a force on my left hand, and my left hand applies a force on my right hand. You see, there are a pair of forces in there. The size of the forces on the first object equals the size of the force on the second object. That's what the third law means. The direction of the force on the first object is opposite to the direction of the force on the second object. So, action and reaction forces always act on different objects. If my right hand applies the action on my left hand, the reaction is by the left hand on the right. You see that? Action equal and opposite to reaction. Now, action and reaction always, always act on different objects and therefore they never cancel each other. Now, consider the motion of a car. Now, a car is able to move because, because of what? As the wheels spin backwards, they grip the road and push the road backward. There, you can see the wheels push the road backward. That's the action. What is the reaction here? The road will push the car forward. You see? So, the road and in turn, the road reacts by pushing the wheels forward. There you are. This is the reaction. So, the action is by the car tires on the road. The reaction is by the road on the car, it is the reaction, it is the reaction of the road on the car that makes the car move forward. Now tell me, what is it that makes you and me uh, free to walk? I'm able to walk because when I kick the ground backward, the ground will push me forward. You see, that's why I'm able to walk. If the ground refuses to push me forward, I will not be able to walk. So, all these phenomena are due to the third law of motion. For every action, the action is I'm kicking the ground backward. The reaction is the ground propelling me forward. Alright? Okay. The recoil of a gun when fired is the result of action-reaction forces. Have you ever experienced firing a .303 or bigger gun? When the bullet goes forward, the action causes a reaction, a recoil of the gun. The bullet flies forward, the gun moves backward. Alright, if you try to get out of a boat, Suppose you row a boat and come ashore and you get onto the board and try to jump ashore. What happens to the boat? It goes back. You see, when you jump, the action is, you see, you are able to go forward because the, the boat, you kick the boat backward, that will make the boat go back and the boat will push you forward action and reaction forces. So, experience the recoil of a gun. As the gases from the gunpowder explosion expand, the gun pushes the bullet forward and the bullet pushes the gun backward. And now, look at a rocket. Now, how does a rocket work? The fuel, the burning fuel is pushed down with a tremendous speed, that's the action. And the, the exhaust of the fuel that applies a reaction force that pushes the rocket upward. 
So it is the action and reaction forces that actually takes the rocket upward. Okay, we will now look at another concept called momentum. What's the meaning of momentum? Every moving object has a momentum. What determines the momentum of a moving object? Now, what is that gives the moving object its momentum? When you talk about a moving object, a moving object has a speed. It's the speed that gives the momentum. A moving object also has a mass. Right? So, is it the velocity of the object that gives it the momentum? Alright, let me give you an example. If a tiny mosquito comes hurtling towards you, will you run away because of the momentum of the fly? It's moving very fast, but I don't think you would want to run away. Well, that's right. Now, if a heavy truck rolls towards you, you see, the fly is coming very fast at you. You are not bothered. You don't want to run away. But if a 16-wheeler rolls towards you, will you stand in front of it? No, I'm sure you will run away. Why? There you are. You don't want to stand in front of that. Now, it is not the velocity of the truck that frightens you. Why? It is the mass. All right? But is it the mass alone that frightens you? Well, if that truck is parked on the roadside, would you run away from it? No. So, look at this. Momentum is a combination of these two things. What two things? Mass and velocity. When these two things combine, you got momentum. So, it is the combination of mass and velocity that frightens you. And it is the combination of mass and velocity that gives a moving object its momentum. So, if I ask you to define momentum, this will go like this. Momentum of a moving object is represented by P, little p, lowercase p. And it is measured as the product of mass and velocity. So, momentum is determined by mass and velocity. It is measured as the product of mass and velocity. We will represent momentum by P. So, we say P equal to mass times velocity. Momentum is mass multiplied by velocity. Now, can you tell me what is the unit for measuring momentum? Mass is measured in kilogram. Velocity is measured in meter per second. Therefore, momentum is measured in kilogram meter per second. That is the unit of momentum. You see, all these simple information are important. These may be the ones I'm going to ask you for the test. So, keep track of all these simple informations. Okay. Let's do a very simple problem. Find the momentum of a 2,000 kilogram car moving at 5 meter per second. I have given you the mass. I have given you the velocity. Find the momentum. Alright? P equal to mass multiplied by velocity. Mass of the car is 2,000 kilograms. Velocity of the car is 5 meter per second. So momentum is 2,000 kilogram multiplied by 5 meter per second. That is 10,000 kilogram meter per second is the momentum. Let's now talk about conservation of momentum. What does it mean to conserve? To conserve means not to waste. In other words, conservation of momentum means momentum is never wasted. Momentum is conserved. See, momentum can be transferred from one object to another. 
but momentum can never be destroyed. Well, that's what it means. Okay. Now, in a closed system, the total momentum of all the objects will remain the same, although collision between objects can result in transfer of momentum from one object to the other. So, if you, if there are two objects, and both has momentum, and if you allow them to collide, the total momentum before collision will be equal to the total momentum after collision. This is what it means. All right? Okay. I want you to watch this demonstration here. I have a red car at rest. Tell me, what is the momentum of this red car? Because it's at rest, its velocity is zero, its momentum is zero. I'm going to give a velocity to the blue car and see what happens when the blue car hits the red car. All right, tell me what happened. Did you see what happened? The blue car suddenly stopped and the red car picked up the motion. So, the total momentum, the momentum of the blue car was simply transferred to the red car. You want to see it again? Now the red car is at rest and the blue car is now going to move and you can see the blue car was brought to a stop. The momentum of the blue car was transferred to the momentum of the red car. The total momentum is conserved. In a collision, momentum does not destroy. What happens if I allow both cars to move and collide? Well, now before collision they both got momentum, there is a total momentum and after collision also. So if you measure the total momentum before collision, that will be the same as the total momentum after collision. Now that's what the conservation of momentum means. Now, watch the two animations and discuss how the conservation of momentum is applied in here. Now, there is a great big fish comes and swallows up the small fish and see how the momentum is conserved. Can you watch how the momentum is conserved? Now, originally, the big fish is moving, the small fish is not moving. When the big fish swallows up the small one, the total mass is greater. That will slow down the big fish so that the momentum is conserved. Is that right? So, when the big fish comes with a great velocity and swallows up the small fish, its velocity is reduced because the mass is increased, the velocity is decreased. But the momentum remains the same. And here, watch what happens now when the big fish is at rest. Watch it again. And the small fish is moving. And that sets the big fish moving backward. So that the total momentum before the swallowing process remains the same as the total momentum after. Alright, so watch the captions and watch these animations, they are good illustrations of conservation of momentum. Okay, we will now have a look at circular motion. What makes it possible to make an object move in a circle? Have you seen objects moving in a circle? Now, how do we set objects move in a circle? I can make this object move in a circle. Is that right? Let me see if I can show that to you. I can make this move in a circle. Now, you know that I'm able to do that because I'm actually applying a force on the string. You see, this goes in a circle like this because I'm applying a force. 
the moment I stop applying the force, this object will simply go away. So an object in circular motion, you can keep an object moving along a circle only if you keep a force applied towards the center of the circle. Now, a car taking a circular turn is continuously changing its motion. So an object moving in a circle is continuously changing its direction. Now, changing its direction means it is changing its state of motion. Now, in order to make something change its state of motion, you need to apply a force. And it is that force that I applied towards the center to keep it moving. Now, I want you to watch the animation of a car taking a turn. Now, you can see as the car moves, the blue passenger runs on to the red driver. Now, who is to be blamed? You can see as the car makes the right hand turn, the driver starts turning immediately due to the force of the door pushing. The passenger then falls on to the driver. Now, why? You see, it is not the fault of the passenger. According to the Newton's law, the passenger is in a state of motion. And in order to change that state of motion, you need a force on you. Now, the driver being uh, attached to the car, the car taking a turn, so it is the driver who actually falls in the path of the passenger. The passenger wants to keep on moving in the original direction. And the driver comes in his path with the car. So it is not the passenger who is to blame. It is the driver who comes in the path. Now, according to Newton's first law, there must be a continuous force acting on the car so that it might change its state of motion. You see, if there is no force, the car will continue to move in a straight line. The only way the car can be made to turn like this is that there is a force. Tell me, where is that force going to come from to make the car turn? It is the friction between the tire and the road that supplies that force. And the force that makes an object move in a circle is called the centripetal force. It is the centripetal force that makes an object move in a circle. So, when I want to make this object move in a circle, the force I am applying is called the centripetal force. Now, centripetal means central seeking, towards the center. So, always there is a force towards the center. Is that right? The moon is moving around the earth in a circle. Now, the force that keeps the moon in that circle is the force of gravity by the earth. The earth is pulling the moon continuously. The moment the earth let go, the moon will simply fly away. You see that? The earth goes around the sun because of the gravitational force on the earth by the sun. So, all these are forces that makes objects move in a circle. And what do you call that force? A force that makes an object move in a circle is called the centripetal force. Now, if M is the mass of the car, and V is its speed along the curve, and R is the radius of that big curve, then I'm going to give you an equation for the centripetal force. The centripetal force then is given by the equation mv squared over r. So if an object to mass m moves with a velocity v along a curve of radius r, the centripetal force acting on it is 
mv squared over r. We just watch that. In the absence of any net force, in the absence of any net force, the passenger in the car continues his motion in a straight line with a constant speed. In fact, that's what the passenger is doing. The passenger wants to keep on moving in the same straight line. You see the blue line indicates the passenger. The passenger is now forced by the driver. The, the passenger falls onto the driver. Actually, the passenger is not falling onto the driver, but the driver is falling onto the passenger. In the absence of that centripetal force, the car will simply go in a straight line. While the car begins to make the turn, the passenger and the seat begin to edge towards the driver. As such, the car is beginning to slip out uh, from under the passenger. You see? It is the car that is going to slide out of the passenger underneath. And because the passenger is on the seat, the passenger is forced. If the passenger is not wearing a seat belt, and if the car goes at a tremendous speed on a curb, what will happen to the driver, I mean to the passenger? The car will simply go away from him, leaving the passenger well, get out of the window or something like that. I, I, I'm sure you know that. The centripetal force necessary for the car to turn is supplied by the friction between the road and the tires. Now, what happens if you take a sharp turn on a slippery road? If you want to take a sharp turn on a slippery road, there is no friction available that means you will not be able to produce the necessary centripetal force. As a result, this car will simply go away from the road. Okay, now we are piling up a lot of information on mo motion of objects in here. Let's now talk about Newton's law of gravitation. Now, Newton's law of universal gravitation is about the universality of gravity. It says every object in the universe attracts every other object with a force that depends on their masses and the distance between them. All objects attract each other with a force that depends on their masses and the distance between them. Now, it, there is no exception at all. These two objects attract each other. There is a force between these two objects. There is a force between this block of wood and me. Every object attracts every other object with a force that depends on the masses of the object and the distance between them. Now, two objects of masses M1 and M2, separated by a distance r, attract each other by force F given by, I'm going to give you a formula. Now, don't get frightened with this formula. All right? I'm simply giving you for information. If two objects of mass M1 and M2 are separated by a distance r, the force of gravity between them is given by this formula. F equal to G, M1, M2 over R squared. Now that G, the big G, is called universal gravitational constant. And it has a value, don't worry about these again. The value of that big G is 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11 Newton per uh, Newton meter squared per kilogram squared. Now, for example, if M sub E is the mass of the Earth and M is the mass of a student, so here we have a student sitting on the surface of the Earth and that student is being, there is a force between the student and the earth. 
What is that force given by? That force equal to G M E M. M E is the mass of the earth. M is the mass of the student. And the distance between them is the radius of the earth. So the force on the student. The student is pulled by the earth with this force. And do you know what that force is called? We said earlier that the force of gravity on any object is called its weight. So this force is actually the weight of that student. So RE is the radius of the earth. This force F is the weight of the student that is equal to mg. So I can say this F which is the same as mg is given by this relation. Okay, let's do a small problem. Determine the force of gravitational attraction between the Earth and a 70 kilogram student at sea level if the radius of the Earth is 6.37 times 10 to the 6 meter. And uh, what all we need to do is go and pick that formula. F equal to G M E M over R e squared. I give you the mass of the earth. I give you the mass of the student at 70 kilogram. I give you the radius. What all you need to do is put those values in there and use a calculator to find the value of that. I want to see how many of you can actually put this on a calculator and find the value. It's actually 600. The weight of the student that we calculated using the law of gravity is 688 Newton. We can also find the weight of the student from his mass alone. Do you know how? Weight equal to mass times acceleration due to gravity. Yes. Weight of the student is W equal to mg. What does G stands for? Accelerated due to gravity. What is its value? 9.8 meter per second squared. So we can calculate the weight of the student as 70 kilogram times 9.8 meter per second squared. That would be 686 newton. Now these two values should be the same. Don't you think so? Why aren't they? We got a small difference. If you want to earn one extra credit point, you see anything I give you that is not mentioned in the syllabus. And if I do it, that will be an extra credit. All right? Because the more work you do, I give you more credit. So if you can write a couple of sentences on why there is a small difference. All right? Let me know and I will give you an extra credit point. Okay, now look at this. If you have a mass M and a mass M, two objects of the same mass separated by a distance D, there is a force between them. Now, you know that the gravitational force between two objects depends on their masses and distance. As the mass increases, the force also increases. As the distance between them increases, the force will decrease. So look at this. If you have a mass M and the second object has double the mass, the force also is doubled. If now you double the first mass and the second mass also doubled, the force becomes four times the original force. Keep the first mass as M and make the second mass three times the original mass. What becomes to the force? It becomes three times the original force. I want you to watch this. I will ask you questions on this. So, if you double the mass of each of these, the force will become four times. If you keep the mass of one a constant, and double the mass of the other, the force will double, and so on. All right, let's now go and see what happens when you change the distance. Watch this. 
if a, an object of mass m, a second object of mass m, separated by distance d, the force between them is f. Now, without changing their mass, I made the distance twice. The distance is now twice as before. Look at this. The force now becomes one fourth. Why? Because on the denominator you have d squared. 2d squared becomes 4d squared. So when the distance is doubled, the force becomes a quarter of the original force. Alright, now what happens here? The masses are not changed, but the distance is made half. What happened to the force? The force became four times. You see, that's very interesting. And the masses are doubled, the distance is made also doubled, the force remains the same. Alright, let's move on. Suppose that two objects attract each other with a force of 16 units. There's a force between two objects that is 16 units. If the distance between the two objects is doubled, what did we say will happen to the force if the distance is doubled? If the distance is doubled, the force will become a quarter of the original force. So, if the distance is now doubled, what is the new force of attraction between the objects? So, when the distance is doubled, the force of attraction is a quarter of the original value. What is the original value? 16 units. So, what is the new force between the objects when the distance is doubled? It is a quarter of 16, that is 4 units. Another one. Suppose that two objects attract each other with a force of 16 units. If the mass of both objects were doubled, and if the distance between the objects remained the same, then what would be the new force of attraction? So the distance is not changed this time, but the mass of each object is doubled, Tell me, what will be the new force? Well, since both masses are doubled, the force now becomes four times. And therefore, the new force is four times 16. That is 64 units. Now, the Earth goes around the Sun in a nearly circular orbit due to this centripetal force provided by the gravitational attraction of the Earth by the Sun. You can see the Earth is going around the Sun and the gravitational force is pulling the Earth towards the Sun. That is the centripetal force. Now, that means the Earth has an orbital speed. You see that? Now, the, the Earth, if the Earth did not have an orbital speed, Earth would have fallen onto the Sun long, long ago. It is the combination of the force applied by the Sun and the orbital speed that keeps the Earth going around the Sun. Alright, now what is orbital speed? If I want an object, suppose I want to throw an object like this. Doesn't this look like a satellite? If I want to throw this object and want to make it go around the Earth in an orbit. What should be that speed? And that speed is what we call the orbital speed. What is the escape speed? Now, what must be the speed I must throw this? So that it will completely escape the gravitational field of the Earth. Is it possible for me to do that? Well. I'm going to show you some illustrations. If I project an object with a certain velocity, and normally it comes back and falls on the surface of the Earth. All right, what happens if I increase the velocity? If I increase the velocity, well, the object goes round, but eventually it comes back. Now, remember, an object that is projected 
has a horizontal as well as vertical motion. The vertical motion brings it back to the Earth. What happens if I still increase the speed of projection? Look at this. If I increase the speed, a time will come when the object will keep going round and round the Earth. This is the orbital speed. In fact, if I can throw this object with about a little more than 9 kilometers a second, that means this must be given a speed of 9 kilometers a second. 9 9,000 meter per second. If you give him such a velocity, this will never fall back on the Earth. It will go round and round the Earth in an orbit. And that is what we call the orbital speed. Now, if I now increase the speed, what will happen? Well, that is still, you can see, this is a very closed orbit. If you increase the speed, the orbit becomes bigger and eventually a time will come when the object will simply go away. It will escape. Now look at this. This one, I gave it such a large speed, it simply goes away. That is the escape speed. So, we now talked a lot about moving object in this lesson. That is, uh, Lesson 1.2, which I divided into three parts. So I want you to review all these. When you listen to the lectures, keep the printed PowerPoints with you and make notes on it. Now remember, all these are very pertaining to our life because this is something that we everyday experience. Motion of objects. We are subjected to this every day. So it is something that is of interest to everybody. I hope you enjoyed this lesson. I will be taking you to Unit 2 later on. In the meantime, it is now ready to go over and look through the practice test and get ready for Unit 1 test. All right, I will see you for Unit 2 later on.